China succeeded with its first planetary landing attempt on Friday, safely landing the Tianwen-1 lander on the surface of Mars, becoming only the second nation to do so. The Tianwen-1 spacecraft was launched from China's Wenchang spacecraft launch site on July 23 of last year. The spacecraft consists of an orbiter, a lander, and the Zhurong rover. After completing a seven-month trek to the Red Planet, Tianwen-1 entered Martian orbit on 10 February 2021. After months of collecting high-resolution imagery to map its landing area, Chinese officials targeted an area inside Utopia Planitia, a plain inside of an enormous impact basin in the planet's northern hemisphere, for the landing attempt. The intended landing spot is a vast field of ancient volcanic rock that may have extensive reserves of water ice beneath its surface. After circling the Red Planet for more than three months, the Tianwen-1 lander, with the rover attached, separated from the orbiter to begin its plunge toward the planet's surface. Protected by a heat shield and traveling at around 4,800 meters per second, the mission safely parachuted down to the Martian surface. Shortly afterward, the heat shield was jettisoned, and at around 1.5 kilometers above the Martian surface, the lander and rover separated from the landing capsule and parachute. At around 100 meters above the surface, the lander fired its thrusters to slow down during the last few seconds of its descent. Just after 11.18 p.m. UTC, on May 14, the 240-kilogram Zhurong rover successfully touched down on the dunes of southern Utopia Planitia. Teams back on Earth will now prepare the rover to complete a panoramic image of the landing area, perform systems checks, and then descend from its landing platform and onto the Martian soil. The rover will then begin an initial 90-day mission to explore and analyze the local area, climate, magnetic field, and look for signs of water ice. The six-wheeled rover carries six scientific instruments on board, including two panoramic cameras, ground-penetrating radar, and a magnetic field detector. The rover is designed to last for at least 90 Martian days. SpaceX will launch the Doge 1 mission to the moon in the first quarter of next year, with Elon Musk's commercial rocket company accepting the meme-inspired cryptocurrency Dogecoin as payment. Founded in 2013 by software engineers Billy Marcus and Jackson Palmer, Dogecoin is an open-source peer-to-peer cryptocurrency. Dogecoin was created as a joke, making fun of the wild speculation in cryptocurrencies at the time. On May 9, Geometric Energy Corporation announced that they have planned a Dogecoin-funded rideshare mission to the moon aboard a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, which usually costs about $62 million to book, or about 129 million Dogecoin as of May 2021. How much money or crypto will change hands has not yet been revealed, nor has information about what other missions will fly on the rocket. Musk tweeted about the deal on Sunday, saying this is the first time that cryptocurrency will be used in space and that it will also be the first meme used in space. The mission follows an announcement Musk made on April 1, promising to put Dogecoin on the literal moon. Since he tweeted about this on April Fool's Day, not everyone took it seriously then. According to a geometric press release, with the mission, SpaceX aims to send a 40-kilogram CubeSat, named Doge-1, on a rideshare mission to obtain lunar spatial intelligence from sensors and cameras on board with integrated communications and computational systems. The statement added that Doge has proven to be a fast, reliable, and cryptographically secure digital currency that is sophisticated enough to finance a commercial moon mission in full. The company also pledged to transact all future missions in Dogecoin, touting benefits such as its security and the fact that trades can happen even outside of business hours. According to Tom Ocenero, SpaceX Vice President of Commercial Sales, this mission will demonstrate the application of cryptocurrency beyond Earth orbit and set the foundation for interplanetary commerce. After more than two years circling a lumpy space rock called Bennu, the OSIRIS-REx probe began heading for Earth on May 10, kicking off a 2.3 billion kilometers journey towards Earth. Origin's Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification Security Regolith Explorer, or OSIRIS-REx, is a NASA Asteroid Study and Sample Return mission. Launched on 8 September 2016 on an Atlas V rocket from Cape Canaveral, the spacecraft rendezvoused with Bennu on 3 December 2018. The probe studied the carbon-rich space rock up close for a while, sizing it up and searching for the best place to spiral down and snag samples. On 20 October 2020, OSIRIS-REx touched down on Bennu and successfully collected a sample. NASA is confident that they were able to retain between 400 grams and over 1 kilogram of sample material, well more than the 60 grams minimum target mass. 
After collecting the rock samples from Bennu's surface, the spacecraft had been lingering near Bennu's patch of space until last Monday, when it fired its main thrusters for seven minutes. The maneuver changed OSIRIS-REx's velocity by nearly 1,000 km per hour, setting it on a 2.5-year cruise towards Earth. After orbiting the Sun twice, the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft is due to reach Earth on 24 September 2023. Upon return, the capsule containing pieces of Bennu will separate from the rest of the spacecraft and enter Earth's atmosphere. The capsule will parachute to the Utah Test and Training Range in the Utah Desert, where scientists will be waiting to retrieve it. NASA personnel will pick up the space rock sample and bring it to NASA's Astro Materials facility at the Johnson Space Center in Texas, which houses the agency's collection of moon rocks, meteorites, and other celestial material. Some studies of the material will begin right away, and samples will also be preserved for future scientists to examine with new techniques that are developed. The OSIRIS-REx team is currently planning for a potential extended mission of the spacecraft to another asteroid after returning the sample capsule to Earth. A Rocket Lab Electron rocket failed to reach orbit on May 15 when its second-stage engine shut down seconds after ignition. Following a one-hour delay due to upper atmospheric wind, the Electron lifted off from Rocket Lab's Launch Complex 1 in New Zealand on Saturday. The mission, dubbed Running Out of Toes, carried two Earth observation satellites for Black Sky's Global Monitoring Constellation. The launch was the first of four dedicated missions under a contract announced earlier this year. The first stage of the vehicle appeared to perform as expected during the flight. Two minutes and 35 seconds after liftoff, the second stage separated from the core stage and ignited its single Rutherford engine. However, the engine shut down seconds later. Telemetry from the launch indicated the vehicle was slowing down and the upper stage failed to reach the intended orbit. An issue was experienced during today's launch, resulting in the loss of the mission, the company announced on social media. Our team is working hard to identify the issue, rectify it, and be safely back on the pad as soon as possible," they added. Meanwhile, the first stage of the Electron did manage to parachute back to Earth after separating from the upper stage and splashed down softly in the Pacific Ocean as part of the company's reusability program. The company is testing technology to guide Electron boosters back to Earth in order to ultimately catch them in mid-air by snagging their parachutes with a helicopter. One change from the previous recovery attempt is a new heat shield at the base of the rocket. The rocket previously had an aluminum-backed shield intended to cover heat loads experienced during ascent only. The rocket now has a stainless steel heat shield covered with thermal protection material to carry the re-entry loads as well as the ascent loads. The launch is the second failure of the Electron in less than a year and the third in 20 launches. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After a series of delays due to heavy winds, on May 14, SpaceX installed the first full-size flight-proven Starship, Starship Serial No. 15, onto the suborbital launch pad B. The installation took place less than 10 days after the prototype survived a high-altitude launch and landing attempt. Two days after the successful high-altitude test flight of SN15, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk revealed that SpaceX might try to refly the spacecraft. The pace at which preparations at the launch site are progressing hints that the flight may occur in a couple of weeks. Also, a SpaceX engineer hosting the company's recent Starlink launch told viewers to stay tuned for additional Starship test flights in the days ahead. Please stay tuned for additional test flights in the days ahead and be sure to check our social media accounts for more Starship updates. Currently, SN15 is missing its six landing legs, which were removed after its flight on May 5th. After a before installing the landing legs, SpaceX will conduct a series of ground tests to make sure SN15 is ready for a reflight. The tests include an ambient pressure test, where the tanks were filled with gaseous nitrogen at ambient temperatures to ensure the structure meets the standards required for flight. The ambient pressure test will be followed by a cryogenic proof test, which will be conducted with cryogenic liquid nitrogen. Once the pressure tests were completed without any issues, SpaceX will move on to static fire tests. It is more likely that one or more of SN15's three Raptors will be replaced after the static fire test. Issues or damage that escaped initial post-flight inspections could easily arise during these ground tests, and if those issues could be rectified, SN15 will fly again. 
it appears that SpaceX may delay SN-16's campaign until after SN-15 reflies and may even rise SN-16's target altitude to 20 kilometers. SpaceX has disclosed details for the first orbital test flight of Starship via an FCC regulatory filing. SpaceX filed an application with the Federal Communications Commission on May 13 for special temporary authority for communications required to support a Starship test launch from the company's Boca Chica test site. In an attachment to the application, SpaceX provided the first details about what it calls Starship Orbital First Flight. The FCC application indicates some truly unusual plans for the first orbital test flight of Starship. The Starship orbital test flight will originate from Starbase, Texas, sending an expendable prototype into space for a brief 90-minute orbit around the Earth before performing a deorbit burn and attempting its first re-entry. The booster stage will separate approximately 171 seconds into flight. The booster will then perform a flip and boost back burn towards Texas and land approximately 32 kilometers from the shore about eight and a half minutes after liftoff. The orbital Starship will continue flying between the Florida Straits and will attain a maximum altitude of 115 kilometers. It will achieve orbit until performing a powered targeted landing, approximately 100 kilometers off the northwest coast of Kauai, in a soft ocean landing. In an included timeline of events for the orbital launch, SpaceX refers to Super Heavy's landing as a touchdown, whereas Starship's soft ocean landing is referred to as a splashdown. This hints that the booster will attempt to land on an unspecified platform a few dozen kilometers off the Texas coast, and the Starship will splash down into the ocean. Later, Elon Musk announced on Twitter that the company is planning an ocean landing to avoid hazards if the vehicle does not survive re-entry. He added that Starship will travel three-fourths of the way around the Earth before splashdown. According to SpaceX, they intend to collect as much data as possible during flight to quantify entry dynamics and better understand what the vehicle experiences in a flight regime, which is extremely difficult to accurately predict or replicate computationally. The application did not specify when the company expects to perform this launch beyond a six-month requested period of operation that starts on June 20. SpaceX can't carry out the launch until it receives a license from the Federal Aviation Administration's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. The license will depend on the status of an ongoing environmental assessment of Starship and Super Heavy launch operations. With the goals set for the first orbital Starship launch, SpaceX is now focusing on rapidly building the orbital launch tower segments at its Texas build site. Workers have completed the assembly of the third orbital launch tower segment and are now working on the fourth segment. Seven or eight such segments are required to complete the 140 meters tall launch tower. A giant Lieber LR11350 crawler crane and its parts arrived at the launch site last week for launch tower stacking. The crane has hook heights of up to 220 meters and has a load capacity of 1,350 metric tons. Powered by a 750 kilowatts engine, the crane delivers outstanding load capacities over its entire operating range. For easy transportation, the crane was disassembled and delivered to the launch site, where it is currently being assembled. Japanese billionaire Yusaku Mizawa, best known for buying a SpaceX Starship flight around the moon, announced on May 13 that he will go to the International Space Station before going to the moon. Mizawa and his production assistant Yozo Hirano plan to fly on the Russian Soyuz flight MS-20 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on 8 December 2021. The two will spend 12 days in space before returning to Earth on December 20. The mission will give Mr. Mizawa an orbital space flight experience before his SpaceX Starship circumlunar flight, scheduled for 2023. On May 12, a U.S. senator added an amendment to a Senate bill that would require NASA to select a second company for its human landing system program. The amendment, known as the Space Preservation and Conjunction Emergency Act of 2021, directs NASA to fund the development of not fewer than two entities in the HLS program, no later than 30 days after the bill is enacted. Last month, NASA awarded a single HLS contract to SpaceX valued at $2.9 billion to develop a lander based on the company's Starship vehicle and to fly a single demonstration mission. It is unclear how the agency would select a second provider, as it could not run a new procurement within 30 days. Selecting one of the losing option A bidders, Blue Origin or Dynetics, based on their original proposals, could prompt a protest from the other companies or from SpaceX. 
The Government Accountability Office is currently reviewing protests filed by Blue Origin and Dynetics on April 26 about NASA's selection of SpaceX for the single HLS award, with a decision due by August 4. Moving on to other Starship updates, on May 11, the nose cone test rig got rolled back to the build site after completing the structural test on a test stand at the launch site. During its structural test phase, a hydraulic ram imparted pressure on the nose cone to mimic the condition the nose cone will encounter at Max-Q during an actual flight. The test results are crucial for SpaceX to build a solid Starship nose cone that can handle extreme pressures during launch. After arriving at the build site, the test rig cage got disassembled and the nose cone cut in half for scrapping. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.